Hello, my fellow gnomes, and welcome to part four of our tower defense series. Now, today we're going to be looking at towers. And so, what better way to do that than add in a tower I've already made over here? And there we go, we've got a, a literal tower. Now, we're not going to worry too much about our main game for now because we've got some, uh, some scripting to do first. And I don't want this to get in the way of our main project. So, if we go to service script service, and we're going to make sure to disable this main script, okay? So if we run the game now, we're not going to have any enemies spawn, right? That's fine. We don't want to worry about anything happening over here because we've got some scripting to do. Now, this is just a single union, right? You could just use a single part for this, um, but I'm just using an, a literal tower union because I thought it looked a bit more interesting. So what we want to do is we need to work out the range of a tower's attack radius. We want to work out the distance between two parts. So how can we work that out? Well, let's add a script into our tower for now. Add in a script. We'll just name this uh, tower testing, okay? Because this isn't our main script. We're probably going to be changing this later, but we're just testing at this point. So what we need to do is we need to get the position of the tower. And we're also going to need to get the position of this other part over here. Uh, let's just name this part enemy, just for example, and then go back into our tower testing script. So what we're going to do, obviously delete this, and then we're going to get a variable for the tower. Local tower is just script.parent, the parent of this script, right? We're directly inside of the tower part. And then the enemy, local enemy, and that is that is inside the workspace. It's directly inside the workspace. It's not in any folders. It's directly inside of it. So it will be called workspace dot enemy. And then we're going to get the position of these two. So in order to get the distance, we need the difference between the two positions. So tower, sorry, tower dot position. And then we're going to minus the enemy dot position, right? So that'll get us the difference between those two. And then if we print that out, we print out the distance and we then run the game. We'll see down the output, we've got one, 4.2 and minus 23. So this is its vector, right? You see this three values because if I was to click this and look at its position value over here, it's got three values and the X, Y and Z value, right? So it's got, that's the Z. That's the X and that's the Y. So it's got these three different values. And now I've worked out the difference between these two values, each of them. Now I can see that the majority of the difference is actually on this uh, Z axis. So if I was to move it further back, let's try that. If I was to move this one further back and then further towards us, we should now see that would be something like minus 28. And that first one, that number will change as well. So if we run it now, okay, so it's minus 17 and minus 39. So we can see the, the gaps got larger, but we don't really want our difference calculated on all three axes at once. That's a bit confusing. So what we really want to do is to sort of get a calculation of them all combined together. And how we can do that is we can wrap all of this, or we can wrap all of this in these little round brackets like so. And at the very end, we can put dot magnitude. And so now when we print out the magnitude or we'll just print out the distance variable, we're getting the magnitude of those two. And we now just get one value. So we can see this is exactly 42 studs away from the tower. And if I was to stop and I was to move my part, they move it over here so it's a lot closer. We can now see it is 10 studs away. And if I move it even closer, you'll see now it is five studs away. Now you see it's still five studs away because it's going to take the position from the central point of this. But it's working out the position from this point we see here, right in the center, all the way down to this one. So there's still a gap, even though it's right near it. If we wanted it to be zero, I'd have to put it right here. So it's right inside of the tower. Okay, so we can delete this example part now and let's start thinking about our actual game. So we'll move the tower back onto the map here and let's think how we're gonna detect all these multiple zombies or mobs. 
Now, before we actually get into activating our mouse walking around the map, let's just have some static enemies to play about with. So I've, uh, I've got some ready to go. I'm just going to paste these guys into the mob solder. And you'll see I've got a red enemy, a blue enemy, a yellow enemy, and a black enemy. Okay, so just four colors. And it's going to allow us to see a bit what's going on here. And I put them into that mobs folder, which is normally what our enemies will spawn into. So back into our tower testing script. And now instead of this enemy variable, let's change this to mobs. So the mobs will equal workspace dot mobs. And instead of just getting one position, we want to get the position for all of them. So we're actually going to need to loop through them now. So let's just delete all of this for now. We'll write it again in a moment. So for I target in I pairs brackets, and then we we'll say mobs get children. So much like when we're getting the children of all the waypoints, right? We're getting everything inside the folder. So everything inside of the mobs folder here. Do and then we can leap through them all. And then we're going to want to get the distance between each of these. So we'll write this line again: distance equals. And in this case, it's now target dot position minus our hour dot position. And then we get the dot magnitude of that again. And then all we're going to do is we're just going to print out the target dot name and the distance. So then if we run this, we should see in our output. Oh, we are going to get an error because I'm using models now, of course. So remember how we got the position of the mobs before we used their humanoid root part. So let's do that. Target dot humanoid root part dot position minus tower dot position. Because again, my tower is just a single part. If my tower was a model, then I would need to get the primary part of it or like a humanoid root part. But since it's just one part, we can get its position. So now if I run that, you can see down the output, we've got blue, 17 studs away. So that's this one. And we've got red, nine studs away. We've got yellow, 33 studs away. And black, 28 studs away. So we can clearly see that red is the closest one. Well, we can see that visually anyway. But we can see that in the output as well. But how can we actually get the script to work out which one is the closest? Well, to do that, we're going to need some more variables to help us. Remember, variables are a bit like saving away a, a bit of information inside a, a bucket, let's say, or a box. So at the moment, we're just kind of traversing through all of this, and we're not really remembering any details. So right at the top, I'm going to create a condition. We'll call this max, I mean, capitals for some reason local max distance. So this is a bit like the kill radius, furthest you'd want them to be able to strike from. And we're going to set this equal to uh, just 50 studs for now. So this is actually going to be wider than all of these enemies are away. We'll set it to 50 studs. And then we're going to set another variable for the nearest target. And currently, when the script starts, there's not going to be any target at all. So this will just be nil. And then as we're looping through all of these, we're going to want to check if the distance that we've just calculated inside of this loop, because remember, this will be calculated each time for each target in the mobs folder. So if that distance is less than the max distance, so if it's less than 50 initially, then, then we know that print and say target.name comma, is the nearest target found so far. And if that's the case, right, then we're going to set that nearest target variable. So the nearest target is now equal to the target that we're currently on. And finally, we're going to need to change this max distance variable, because we're no longer interested in things that are 50 studs away, if we've just found something that is, say, 25 studs away. So we're only interested then in things that are less than the distance we have just found. So we'll set change that value. Max distance will now equal distance. 
So now if we run this again, you can see down in our output, we'll scroll up. So first one it went to, it can be some semi-random which one it goes to first, but it's, it's gone to blue first in the list. Found blue 17 studs away and it said blue is the nearest target found so far. Then it went to red and of course the distance of red was less. So red was the nearest target found so far. And then it went to yellow and black, but because both of them were further away, then we didn't get that nearest target found anymore. Okay, so now we've done that, how about we sort of wrap this all into a function and actually start to do some damage? Because at the moment, we're just doing this once. So if these enemies are moving around, right, it's never going to update. It's only going to run once at the start of the game. So we'll wrap this in a new function, local function, find nearest target, we can call it. And then select all this, control X, control V, paste it inside of our function here. And then once we've done all this, once we've found a nearest target, we're gonna to need to return this. So we'll send this information back to whoever calls the function. Remember a function, the code inside of it won't actually run on its own. It has to be called by somewhere. So whoever calls it, will send them back information about the nearest target we've found. And if we haven't found anyone, then it's just going to be equal to nil. Then once we've done our function, we're going to wrap it inside of a loop. So while true do, because we're going to want to just keep looping forever. A bit later on, we're going to probably want to only loop while the game is actually running. But let's not worry about that for now. And then we're going to call this function, the find nearest target function. Now, because we're sending some information back, we need to capture that and we're going to capture that information in a variable. So local target is going to equal whatever information is sent back to us from this function. So that nearest target variable. And then we're going to check if we have a target, because remember, it could be nil if there's nobody near at all. Then the target dot it's humanoid. I'm going to call the take damage function, take damage and however many, which health we want to take away. So let's just take away 25. And then finally, once we've done all of this, uh, let's just wait. Because remember with a while true loop, um, it will just try and do everything simultaneously and it can actually cause your computer to crash. So we don't want that. We don't need it all to time out. So we put task dot wait and we'll just update every second for now. There's going to be a, like a one second cooldown essentially. You'd see it starts to damage red and then it fully kills off red and then it, it, keep, it, uh, it doesn't damage any of the others, we'll notice. It's going to keep trying to damage red even though it's zero health. But there we go, it's killed that one. So, with this in mind, now let's go and activate our main mobs once more. So, I can move all of these mobs. I can just delete all of them, don't need them anymore, boring, goodbye, and I can reactivate my main script. So where I click disabled, click that again, now it's enabled. And now if I run the game, let's see what happens. A zombie, and they're going to start to get killed as they come out. Now we will notice that our zombies don't get destroyed, they're going to be <laughs> stuck there in these rather desperate looking corpses. So we're gonna to need to clear them up when they get killed. That's an easy enough fix. Stop the game and head into our mob module script. And then down when we spawn them in, just after we set the collision group, we're going to create or use an event, say new mob dot humanoid. And the humanoid has an event called died. We connect this into a function like so. And then all we're going to do, maybe we'll wait uh, half a second so you can sort of see that you've clearly killed them. And then we will destroy them. So just like we destroyed them at the top, if they reach the waypoint, final waypoint, we're also going to want to destroy them before if they get killed. So now when we run, See a zombie comes out and it instantly gets destroyed. 
it instantly gets destroyed again and then the next wave can start and our tower can start destroying them all over again. Now this tower has got a pretty big range so we can see pretty much overkill at this point. We set to 50 studs. Can it catch these guys? Oh, it's getting a bit overwhelmed because it has got a one second delay on the thing. Uh, we could copy this and paste in a new one and then sort of drag this over here. And then this tower could pick up a few more enemies. And then I think we've got them all covered. <laughs> there we go. So obviously, this is a good start. But next up, we're really going to want to be able to place these towers. I want the player to be able to place them. And in order to do that, well, we've got to do something called ray casting. And that's going to be a whole other thing. So I think this about does us for this video. We've got some towers working, but we've still got a lot of work to do. If you have found this video helpful, then please give it a thumbs up and even consider subscribing. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.